Hello, everyone. We're going to let our participants file into our Zoom room here and get started in just a minute. All right, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This is our third in our four part series of webinars on drones for workplace safety. So thank you all for joining us here today. My name is Emily Whitcomb. I'm the director of our Work to Zero initiative here at the National Safety Council. I'll tell you a little bit more about Work to Zero in just a second, um, but I want to kick us off here by sending out a huge thank you to Univar Solutions for sponsoring our webinar series through the month of September. And I'm gonna hand it over to Tracy with Univar to say a few words. Thank you, Emily, and uh, thanks and welcome to everyone who is attending today's webinar. Uh, as Emily said, my name is Tracy Rogers. I'm the Director of Health and Safety for Univar Solutions. I'd like to start by saying uh, we are uh, honored uh, to be sponsoring this webinar of you from the top using aerial drones uh, in high-risk situations today. Univar Solutions is a place where people matter, and our first value is that we always put uh, employee safety uh, first, and we, uh, that is actually one of our values is we are serious about safety. So this value is uh, even more strengthened by our long-standing relationship with the NSC and their guidance in providing uh, the necessary guidance to keep uh, employees safe. So uh, once again, thank you to the NSC for allowing us the opportunity to introduce uh, our company and this webinar. So back over to you. Thank you, Tracy, and, and thank you to everyone at Univar. Um, if anyone in the audience is interested in how they can support the Work to Zero initiative, we've actually popped a link in the chat. So Work to Zero is a grant-funded initiative here at the National Safety Council. We got started in 2019 with funding from the McElhattan Foundation, and we are focused on helping employers adopt life-saving technology. So we're really working hard on creating tools and resources to help make innovation more more accessible for employers. So I want to share with you some of the resources that we currently have available. We have put out a series of reports um, over the past year, um, some specific to technologies um, such as drones. Um, the first report we put out here at the bottom, Safety Technology 2020, looks at hazardous situations and relevant technology solutions. That is a very dense report, tons of information in there. If you haven't checked it out, um, it is free. All of our resources are free at nsc.org forward slash work to zero. Uh, drones is our fifth webinar series, I believe, that we've done in the last year. We started off by um, talking about covid 19 and, and related technologies. We've looked at immersive technology, fatigue in the workplace, um, proximity sensors. All of those are recorded and available free up on our website, nsc.org forward slash work to zero. You'll just want to go to that resources tab um, and find all of our resources. I also want to mention um, Safety Tech AI. So we have a, a partnership with DuPont Sustainable Solutions. They have a great searchable catalog of technologies with safety application. Um, so if you haven't had a chance, go and check that out as well. I also want to mention some upcoming events. So our NSC Congress and Expo is just around the corner. Um, and we have a really um, a bunch of exciting um, things going on there around technology. So this year we're going to have a, a safety technology pavilion. Uh, we will have, I think, about 10 um, booths within that pavilion, different startup technology companies, as well as a work to zero booth. So if you're attending Congress this year, please stop by the safety technology pavilion, check it out. There's also a stage. So there'll be some presentations in the booth. And then work to zero has three technical sessions at Congress. Uh, so make sure you put those on your agenda. And we will be releasing our new digital readiness assessment and white paper at Congress. And actually, if you join us next week at our, our webinar um, on submersibles, I'm going to give you all a, a little bit of a sneak preview on those um, digital readiness uh, resources. So check that out. And then our Work to Zero Summit is coming up quick here, February 17th through the 18th, and we'll be in Louisville, Kentucky. 
So looking at our series, we started off by doing a high level introduction. Then we looked at confined spaces. Uh, today, we're gonna look at aerial. And then next week, uh, submersible drones. And again, I'm gonna give that sneak preview of our digital readiness assessment. Um, these should be recorded up available on the website now if you missed one of the previous webinars, but make sure you get registered for next week webinar as well. So before we hop into a conversation, um, I wanted to start by, you know, talking about why we're here. Why are drones important for workplace safety? So in our initial research for Work to Zero, uh, we wanted to identify the top hazardous situations for workers. So across industry, in what job tasks were workers uh, most likely to um, die? And we actually found that 21% of the non-roadway workplace fatalities were occurring when a worker was working at heights, um, and that tended to be a worker falling from a height. Um, and this is one of those top risks that drones really has the potential um, to help mitigate it, and, and especially today when we're talking about aerial drones. Um, so very important to consider, you know, the safety application of all these new technologies. And when um, our employers are thinking about adopting technology programs, we really want them to start by thinking about what are their top hazards and, and really what are they trying to solve for. So if you haven't seen um, that paper of our um, top 18 hazardous situations and relevant technology solutions, that is available on our webpage under the resources tab. All right, let's meet our panelists for today. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. We're going to go from left to right here. So, Corey, if you wouldn't mind saying hello. Okay, excellent. Well, hi, everybody. Um, pleased to join you today and um, to be involved with the Work to Zero initiative. So thanks, Emily and, and Morgan, for and everybody else. Uh, I know there's other people in the background uh, that have uh, that are, are working today. And, Tracy and Univar, thanks for sponsoring. It's uh, great to join you this morning. So uh, I'm with Nutrien, as you can see behind me, uh, Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta, Canada. So up north of the border. And um, it's a beautiful day up here for flying drones. But um, the SHE manager at the site, been here about 17 or 18 years. And we ventured into drones a few years ago as a security initiative. And it's really taken off and had some really interesting SHE applications as well as inspections and emergency response. So got a few pictures and some other things we can share, but uh, that's that's me in a nutshell. So glad to be here today. Yeah, glad to have you, Corey. Thank you. John. Yes, there's, thanks for joining today and for the opportunity to speak. I feel so inadequate. I don't have a nice background that says AECOM on there, so I, I guess I got to work on that. So I am John Delp. I'm the North American Chief Pilot for AECOM. I'm also one of our senior instructor pilots, as well as have my uh, level one UAS thermography certificate. Um, I'm an old guy. I've been hit with AECOM for 26 and a half years. The last four of those have been flying drones full time. Um, I mostly specialize in close infrastructure inspections, including bridges, both under deck and topside dams, industrial facilities, things of that nature. So pleased to be here and, and join in the conversation. Yeah, thank you, John and Antoine. Hi, hello everyone. I'm excited to uh, talk to you today as well. My name is Antoine, uh, located in California, uh, not too far from the Golden Gate Bridge, as you have in your background, John. And uh, I've been working in drones and robotics for about 15 years. And really the reason is when I was about 16, I really wanted to fly. And my parents said, it's too expensive, too dangerous, you will not fly. And I had a career as, a, as an engineer and then the, the urge to, to be aloft uh, was too strong. And eventually uh, I moved completely to uh, following my passion for aerial robotics. And then that expanded to, to robotics. But throughout 15 years, I've, I've worked everything from government, commercial, I was a startup CEO. I was uh, doing also working for a hardware company, a software company. I've been doing projects in geospatial. I've been working with a lot of companies uh, outside of the US. And cur currently my role at Accenture, which is a professional services company, is really to, uh, to oversee and lead our, our business in North America related to drones and robotics. And it's good to meet everyone. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, Antoine. We want to make sure our audience has an opportunity to get engaged with other attendees as well as our panelists. So I would love if our audience could take the opportunity to introduce themselves in the chat. Um, and just a little tip um, above where you type in your message, you want to switch it to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see your message. But if you could introduce yourself maybe share your experience why you're here are you interested in drones are you already using drones in what capacity what are you trying to solve for we'd also love to know how work to zero can support you um, our job is to make resources for you all so it's really helpful if we can hear from you what you need what you're looking for um, and you also have the opportunity to ask questions of the panelists so we will have a moderated discussion um, and then after that, we will answer audience Q&A. So there is a Q&A tab that you can click um, and uh, put in any questions that you have. And then attendees could also upvote questions. So we always start from the top. So make sure you vote for questions that you like or add in any that you don't see. Great, I already see some engagement in the chat. That is fantastic. So let's uh, launch into our first moderated question here. We would love if our panelists could share some, you know, case studies or examples of using aerial drones for high risk situations. And I'm going to ask Corey, could you kick us off on this one and, and share your experience? Sure. It's kind of funny because with my last name, I usually end up at the bottom of most lists. So, you know, I get to just sit back and relax. But um, yeah, for sure. At the top today. So that's cool. Um, I'm just going to take over the screen here, Emily, and I, I just have a few pictures that we can kind of talk through. Uh, so let me know when you can see that. You're good, Corey. Good to go. Okay. So just a few examples, uh, you know, the question is, what are some of our high-risk situations? So what you see in the screen right now is, is a view from about 300 feet above ground level uh, above our plant and the target is uh, the top of the tallest tower now what happens periodically or what happened periodically is our operations people would have to scale this tower on vertical ladders and a series of platforms to get to the very top to verify oops and see my pictures are in the wrong order <laughs> okay let me just close that one uh, to verify that this seal is in place. Now you can see that uh, if, you, if you know valves, you can see that this is open because the stem is up and there's a seal through it, which means it's sealed open. Um, this is the very same picture just zoomed in from that first one. So, so instead of having people climb that big old tower several times a year to do seal verification, we can now do this, submit the photos to our regulator and they check the box and say, okay, that's great. The seal is verified. Um, so it's, it's a regulatory driven requirement. Uh, and if I can just talk back to that other picture, you know, we talked about, Emily, you mentioned the, the number of workers that get injured and unfortunately perish from falls from heights. Um, obviously this is quite a controlled environment even when you're up there, but uh, being in an operating plant, a lot of uh, pressure safety relief devices are actually below this elevation. So there are other hazards to consider as well, right? Not just falls. When you're working at these heights, um, if the plant were to trip and safeties were to lift and protect the equipment as they should, um, people could find themselves in the line of fire. So that's that was one big win. Uh, do that a couple times a year. Some other just real quick things. Uh, pond liner inspections. This was kind of an interesting conversation. Prior to this, we would have to actually put people over the fence onto the liner. We'd have to have fall protection, flotation devices, watch people. Um, now, 30 minutes, send the drone over, you know, we can do a quick visual inspection and then we can determine our work scope. Um, so I'll just click through the rest here and see what we've got. Uh, some other things that are maybe less risky, but just more kind of for that, uh, you know, historical documentation, uh, time-lapse pictures of projects. So that's one that we've got going on actually right now. That's a building replacement. We talked about that one. Inspections is something else. So our new drone actually has thermal imaging, which is, is kind of cool and fun to play with. So there's a picture of our flare stack uh, in, in action. 
So inspections and engineers are quite uh, um, interested in that one. Emergency response. This is just a training exercise, but um, and I've kind of lost my controls here, but um, you can see you can do thermal imaging on a response scene. So, you know, the more we learn about this, and here's actually some emergency response training where you can look down from the top and see how your water curtains and your lines are all laid out. So the, the more we do this, oh, sorry, uh, the last one here. Um, this as well, this is taken from about 300 feet away and a couple hundred feet in the air. This is a transformer that's up on um, some power poles that have actually since flooded as our site has changed. So in order to determine, you know, what the make model and specs were, we either had to float people in boats to scale the power poles, uh, or we just fly the drone over. <laughs> so it's, you know, the more we the more we use it, the more uses we find, and it's uh, it's 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 been a really interesting ride, put it that way. So I think with that, I'll just stop there and maybe hand it over to our next panelist. Yeah, that's 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 kind of the gist of the interesting ones I've got there. Yeah, no, thank you, Corey. And I'm really interested in that last picture you showed because I've heard from uh, people that one of the, the drawbacks to using drones is that you might not get good quality pictures, but repeat how far away that picture was taken from. <laughs> Okay, so that that image, uh, that image of the nameplate on the on the uh, transformer was taken, and I, I don't, I could, I could get the details, but roughly about three hundred feet. Um, oh, what am I? What am I trying to say? About a three hundred foot horizontal distance, and about two hundred feet in the air. Now, I, I will tell you that uh, your ability to zoom and the quality of your imagery when it comes to, you know, commercially purchased drones is directly proportional to how much you pay for them. <laughs> so, so, so the one that we have now actually does have digitally enhanced zoom. So that's why we're able to get those tighter pictures. Um, the version we had before wasn't quite that robust, but the technology is advancing and, and the zoom capabilities are just amazing. Oh, that's fantastic. No, thank you. I really appreciate you um, sharing those pictures with us. And I think John and, and maybe Antoine will have some media to share with us as well. John, I'll actually hand it over to you if you want to share your work with um, aerial drones. Sure. I presume you have the slides, Emily. I do. Let me skip right. over here while while you um, talk. So yeah, I have a couple of couple examples here to show about recent projects that we've completed that uh, really fit the bill for um, keeping our workers safety. Uh, this particular project is the Greenville Cable Stay Bridge Inspection. This goes from Lake Village, Arkansas to Greenville, Mississippi. It was a comprehensive bridge inspection. There was um, anywhere from 20 to 30 individuals uh, working on the inspection. We had um, guys walking deck side. We had ones on the traveler underneath the main span. We had as you can see in the top left photo, a man lift where they could get up to about 100 feet and, and um, do certain inspections from that. Um, and then in the bottom right, you'll see uh, repellers who are actually checking the towers and uh, they're Sprat trained uh, employees who, who do that work. And that's, that's approximately 400 feet above the Mississippi River. It's um, pretty harrowing, you know, even flying up there, looking down from the drone, it was a pretty scary scenario. You can see in the photo on the bottom left there, how, how tall the towers are above the Mississippi River and, and as well as moving traffic. So, you know, from our drone, um, we can capture imagery. They wanted, uh, in this case, it's Mississippi DOT. They wanted imagery of every one of the dampening devices, which is what you see there. And they wanted specifically to know if the cotter pins were installed. So using our drone or our zoom camera, we could zoom into every single one of those and take an image. Or in this case, we were had a, a bridge inspector with us who could verify it. So we didn't necessarily have to take an image of every single one. But uh, it really keeps the workers safe and they don't have to. Um, they, they still did a repelling of the towers to check the concrete and check the connections of the cables at the towers. But it, it minimized what they were involved in have to, having to repel. So. Uh, going to the next one, Emily. So this is the Delaware Department of Transportation high mast inspection. So we do this periodically throughout the year. This happens to be a uh, 
a light pole. Actually, it's two different poles in this image, but a uh, light pole. This one is 120 feet tall. The lift to get a worker up to that height is rather expensive and access can be really challenging because of the grade of the ground. So in this case, we can fly our drone up, take all the imagery needed, capture you know, any, any issues that may be that Del Dot would have to respond to. Um, in this case, these poles were brand new. Del Dot was getting ready to assume ownership from the um, contractor. So they wanted them inspected. So using our drones, we can go up and make sure that all the components are in place. Go ahead to the next one. So this is the Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln Cable Stay Bridge. This is in Louisville, Kentucky. So again, just a, another scenario of keeping the worker safe. So we uh, utilize the drone to inspect each of the cables um, flying from both the inside and outside edge of the cables. We close lanes of traffic down so that our drone could fly safely. Once we were on scene, um, we realized that the inspectors did not have a snooper truck to check the underside of the bridge. So the image in the bottom right is the connection point for each one of those cables. So they asked if we could fly the drone and capture an image for every single connection point. And I can't remember off the top of my head how many there are, 80 or 90 uh, poles or um, cables there. So we capture an image of the end of every single one of those because it was an area that was inaccessible to the inspectors. They would have to connect their harness up and literally hang off the edge of the side of the I-beam in order to capture an image of the bottom of each of those caps. And so it was much safer with the drone. We could go fly along the edge of the bridge and capture an image of every single one of those end caps for them. And from that, they can see if the bolts are intact or if they're leaking oil in this case. Go ahead to the last one. And this is the uh, NASA Hangar 1 project out in um, NASA Ames Research Center out in Mountain View, California. It's next to Moffett Airfield. So this is a 1940s blimp hangar that they've removed the skin from it and it's a historic landmark. And so we were out there to complete an overall inspection on that. So we captured some 30,000 images of the structure, it's about 1,100 feet long, 300 feet wide, 300 feet high, and 200 feet wide. Uh, we did have an on-scene inspector who was climbing over the facility, but utilizing the drone, we can capture all the imagery needed from the outside, and then they can see if there's any uh, any um, issues with the metal and degradation that's uh, happening from the environmental concerns. So. Very interesting project. So utilizing the drone, we can keep our workers safer and keep them on the ground. Absolutely, no, thank you for um, sharing that. And I'm gonna hand it over to you, Antoine. Sure, I mean, really there's, there's plenty of use cases and application for the use of, of drones for safety. And there's actually a number of reports that have mentioned like there's been literally hundreds of lives being saved. Uh, by not performing something dangerous or rescuing, you know, somebody who was who was lost. So the so the value is still there. Um, I have a couple of stories that really kind of grabbed me uh, emotionally. Even um, ten years ago, when I uh, when I was really getting started in the drone sector, and the drone sector commercially was just moving from government to uh, to commercial. I remember very clearly one day I had uh, somebody from Florida call me. And uh, she said, uh, uh, I have a roofing company. I, uh, I install uh, uh, solar panels and I have to do a whole uh, condominiums um, uh, as well as do the gutters. So it was working between the contractor doing the, the, the solar and, and the roofer. And uh, you know, she said, yesterday, I, I just lost somebody, uh, you know, terrible accident, uh, somebody fell. And uh, it was just really devastating for the, you know, for, for, for the company, uh, for the people of the company. And, uh, and the question was, you know, how can I really use a drone to, to prevent from putting people from having to climb a ladder if they don't have to? And, and the work was really to, to measure, measure the size of the roof, know where the, uh, the uh, air conditioning units were on the roof, and really get kind of a, a topography of, of the roof. Uh, I remember another story of, uh, it was with a government uh, customer 
who said they were inspecting uh, the turbine of a, a very large uh, dam. So it was a dam inspection and there had been a, a fatality. And the question was, can I use a drone instead of just putting uh, you know, my people at risk? So um, I've worked with uh, firefighters who you know, often are put themselves in a dangerous situation, uh, work with wildfires as well as uh, uh, you know, urban, uh, urban incidents and urban fires. And really and from the air, you can really prepare what you will do uh, in the terrain. So Corey showed images where you actually don't have to climb or you don't have to go with a boat somewhere. Uh, which is fantastic. The other use case is, you know, you know, you will, you know, cut, cut that that limb of that tree that's overhanging dangerously above uh, above a power line, or you know, you will have to bring some equipment to to repair that that pole. But what tool do you do you need? What part do you need? So instead of going twice, uh, you know, climbing twice. You can only do it once by sending the drone ahead of time and really knowing uh, what you will do. So, just wanted to share, a, you know, a, a different, uh, different perspective just from my personal experience. And there's some experiences which are uh, when you work in the utility sector, uh, you have to go to uh, poles and climb the poles. And you know, in the spring, there's often a, a rattlesnake. And the the field workers are, you know, are fearful of just walking through the brush. And you know, being beaten by a snake, and no one wants to be, you know, uh, put in that situation. So, being able to to use drones has countless number of use cases for safety purposes. Absolutely, thank you for sharing some of those stories. That's really helpful for our audience. And just looking through those that have introduced themselves, it, it definitely sounds like. Um, some would be uh, interested in these case studies that you all are sharing. I'm gonna flip us over to the next moderated question here, but for our audience, um, again, feel free to pop questions in the Q&A box or upvote questions that you see that you would like me to ask our panelists. I'm gonna give each of you a chance to kick off a question. question. So John, I'm gonna have you start here. If you could share or elaborate on the benefits of using this type of technology, if you have any you know, measurable impacts you could share, that would be great as well. Well, as I mentioned, so um, for most of our cable stay bridge inspections, obviously we're using certified bridge inspectors. I'm not an engineer. I'm not even a bridge inspector. I'm a drone pilot. So I work with really smart people. So we can use our drones and give those bridge inspectors imagery and views that they need in order to complete their inspections. It's never going to replace a hands-on inspection. There are various levels of bridge inspections and so this is just a tool that they can use to get a visual inspection on those cables. In this case, um, specifically the Greenville Cable Stay Bridge down in Mississippi, Mississippi DOT didn't want um, them using the repelling apparatuses because the, the way that it operates and slides down the cable can actually damage the housing of the cable. So in that case, the drone is non-destructive. It can fly you know, away from the bridge and you don't have to worry about any damage to any of the equipment. So it really made things easier and the inspectors can view a live stream coming right from the drone. So um, then they can direct us whether or not they need us to zoom in, zoom out, go here, go there. And it, it really keeps them safer. Thank you, John. And let's see, Antoine, I'll hand it over to you next. So, I mean, the first benefit of the technology is, is basically putting a pair of eyes uh, wherever you want in space and being able to, you know, not, not go that distance with a rope or uh, uh, scaffolding or, or just whatever it is. Uh, but then beyond the, the real time, uh, drone generate data. Those are digital sensors. And once you have this data, uh, you, can, you can review it later. You can review an image of that same exact, you know, transformer uh, five or 10 years later. You can perform uh, analytics so that instead of, uh, you know, going through uh, 30,000 images, you use uh, software to be able to, to make sense of the data, whether it's, you know, finding a crack or whether it's putting it as, as a map instead of just as a series of photo. Uh, so to me, the, the main benefit is it's digitizing 
uh, the, the inspection or the monitoring or whatever the task at the hand is. And it, it provides this data on which you can just apply a number of, of rules and processes and integration and uh, detection, uh, change detection, uh, et cetera. Um, and you know, once you have that, you can even think that you can better understand you know, uh, the, the life of a bridge and the deterioration over time. You can even possibly correlate that with, you know, with weather or with a particular type of, of cement or just whatever it is. And, and just kind of augment the intelligence of uh, you know, whatever you are you know, looking at. So to me, that's the, the main power, frankly, that power of, of the data is mostly untapped today. Uh, because we still have a number of people getting, uh, getting on with uh, using drones and, and the data. And then once you deal with data, it's, it's not that, that simple. Um, actually, the, the, the most simple step that people can take is you know, buying a drone. Buying a drone, you know, put your credit card and, and, and you buy one. Uh, it doesn't mean you'll be profession, pr proficient with flying it. doesn't mean you'll be safe even flying it. doesn't mean you'll be uh, you know, knowing how to analyze the data. Um, so, so there's a lot more than the drone, uh, but the value is definitely there as we talked in the last question. Yeah, thank you, Antoine. And that actually reminded me um, last week on our webinar, I believe it was Mosaic that talked about one of their big benefits is be able to compare footage over time. I think he was talking about comparing footage um, in their mine shafts to see uh, changes over time. So really interesting. And Corey, do you want to um, add to the conversation here? Yeah, well, not much to add. I, I do have a couple images if I can just rob the screen one more time. Absolutely. But as as John and Antoine have both uh, very well said, you know, the, the drone is never going to replace, you know, hands on. But from a plant perspective, what we, um, the benefit that we see is, is it helps us plan scope. Right. Um, so if we can get up there and have a look, our planners can look at it, our engineers can look at it, and maybe the job wasn't as big as they thought it was, or unfortunately, sometimes maybe it's bigger. Um, and the Antoine's comments about the time lapse, and I've only got one shot up here, and I, I just kind of flashed up earlier. Um, this is one of our time lapse kind of photos. We we I, I fly the drone out here a few times a year, and what this is is it's a reclamation project. Now it's so that's not really a risk reduction, but it's it's a cost reduction because to get aerial photos several times a year or year after year is very costly from an airplane. Um, because of their rules, they have to fly quite high, so you get a very wide photo, and you know your image is very small. So so what this is is this is this year's image of of the last five or six years of a reclamation project that started off looking like this. So here at Fort Saskatchewan, just a little quick history lesson here. Um, our One of our companies that came before us produced uh, phosphate fertilizer. Phosphate produces gyp stacks. This is what a gyp stack looks like when it's active. So we had some gyp stacks on our site and we ceased production 20 years ago. As they've dried up, we've pushed them in. We've planted trees in conjunction with our federal government doing a carbon capture thing, you know, all of those good environmental things. And we've got the time lapse from these were just were little tiny sticks in the dirt to what's now a, a full fledged forest. So um, I guess more of a posterity thing, but it's kind of cool to look at those pictures now uh, year after year and how that forest has grown. Yeah, absolutely. Really appreciate you um, showing that to us. So I have one more question for our panelists here before we kick it over to our audience Q&A. And my question for you all is, what are some of the best practices or challenges? So would really love if you all could share, you know, maybe suggestions to our audience here that are thinking about drones or, or trying to figure out how to get started. What have you learned along your way? What challenges have you had to overcome? Um, and I believe, Antoine, this is your turn to kick us off. Okay, great. So uh, you, might, you might love drones, you might you know, fly a drone, you might see a lot of value, uh, but really uh, there's a lot of work uh, that you might have to do within your organization to prove the, the value case, to even 
be authorized to, to use that tool in your, uh, in your work. So my, my recommendation is, you know, first, I mean, there's really plenty of literature uh, just, just out on the internet about, about the value, whether it's in uh, unsafe hours avoided, whether it is, uh, if it's in the cost of the inspection reduced by so many percent. Um, you know, so start educating yourself uh, so that you can basically make a, a value case. Uh, then once you start to, to fly and experiment, it's really important that, that you, have, you have your own metrics uh, that, that you, you know, measuring yourself against, as well as have a procedure, procedure for uh, flying safely, procedure for, you know, uh, abiding to the, uh, the, the regulations, the, the compliance, even within, within your company. And then communicate your, your success, communicate what's working very well. I mean, Corey showed some, uh, and John showed some photos that, you know, the, the value is there. If you tell the story, if you show that you didn't have to, you know, to put two people with a, a rope and a, a flotation device uh, and were able to do that in 20 minutes. I mean, that's, that's, that's a no brainer. Once you have communicated uh, that within your organization and you see that, you know, you know people get it. And, then you can start uh, educating them, you know, bringing them to the field, showing them, showing them photos, and actually setting up a little committee within your organization. And it can be really across even business units where you can have almost kind of a, 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 mini, a mini governance with a couple, you know, drone champions, a couple of people within maybe legal, uh, of course, safety and security, uh, inspection, uh, the different uh, lines of business. Uh, and then you involved uh, IT because as you get to generate data, they want to know, you know, are we exposing our data to, to you know, uh, to, to other people, uh, et cetera. So I would recommend, uh, of course, start small, but be a constant advocate by having some data points and some value cases that you can share with people. Uh, because the kind of the, the cool drone, the shiny toy, uh, you know, very quickly that's going to vanish. And actually, once you start flying uh, regularly, you know, I mean, sure, it's, it's nice to fly a drone, but that's not what you have in mind, right? You have a task to do, or a job to do, or, you know, you, you want to be safe, or you, you're listening for, you know, helicopters that might be, uh, uh, you know, coming through. So I, I'll put also a couple, link in the, a couple links in the chat window. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of organization that is really starting to, push actually the use of drones and UIS because they know the value. And actually, if you see some of the, the procurement and the tenders nowadays, if it's really a good application for drones, often the, the organization that is putting that uh, in for bids will actually expect people to use the best tools and the most economically viable and the safer tools. So at some point, those organizations that are not using there's great tools if it makes sense, right? Let's not apply a drone when, when it doesn't make sense. And there's been plenty of that in the past when drones were uh, all the hype. Uh, you know, then a lot of organizations will actually be left out if they actually don't use. It's like, you wouldn't imagine us not using, you know, uh, email to conduct business, right? But, you know, to, you know 25 years ago, I'm, I'm sure they were uh, a, a lot fewer and now it's, it's expected. Uh, so drones are becoming, uh, I wouldn't say a commodity yet, but they're becoming uh, definitely accepted uh, and to some extent expected. Thank you, Antoine. Some great words of advice there. I'm going to hand it over to you, John. So I'm going to second Antoine and say uh, develop an operations manual is, is key to success. Uh, we spent a lot of time recently on a rewrite with our commercial UAS director. Um, you know, put everything in there that you think you may need, checklists, emergency procedures, maintenance, things like that that are going to make your program a success. Um, my challenges are field work is challenging. When you get out in the field, if it can go wrong, it's going to go wrong. So be ready to, to change some of my bridge inspections. Um, there's always scenarios doing those that that you run into. I, I can't take off, you know, electromagnetic interference in the bridge. I can't take off from the bridge deck. So I've got to manipulate my my takeoff points. 
you may look, you know, as much planning as you want to do, you may look in Google Earth and think I can take off from here, 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 and here, and go out there. And all of a sudden you realize that that's a 45 degree slope. And this one has four foot tall grass in it. And this one's private property. And so you've got to be able to, to manipulate that and be able to think on your feet and be able to um, change those things up. So for best practices, don't start with a high risk scenario. Don't start with a massive bridge inspection that you, you know, your company is doing. Don't start with an industrial facility inspection. Go out, find a drone, do it legally, which I saw a question. Hopefully we can touch on the legality of flying drones, um, but do it legally. Go out, take some pretty pictures, find one of your projects and go out and go up to 300 feet and take some pretty marketing photos and then show those around your company. And once your project managers and, and those in charge see those and, and it'll really open their eyes to the possibilities. Thank you, John and, and Corey, words of advice for us. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, all, all very well said so far. Um, and again, if I can just rob the screen one more time, uh, Emily, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let something play that um, I, I was just kind of excited to share with everybody. So this is, is kind of our evolution of where we're at these days. I'm just gonna let it play while I talk. Um, <clears throat> and hopefully that's working, perhaps. We can see the video, it's just buffering a little bit. There it goes. Oh. So, so this is at our sister plant across the river. And um, what this is was a replacement project. You'll see the turbine that's getting lifted out of here. It's a end of life, 35 year thing. And, you know, they, they wanted some aerial drone shots of the, the old one coming out, the new one coming in. So we'll just let that play, but that's, that's kind of what's going on over there. Um, but as far as best practices, you know, Antoine, <laughs> I wish I had you when we started this, we've been at this about five or six years. And uh, yeah, well, we kind of did it all backwards. We just, we had some uh, discretional funding one year, thought we should buy a drone, try it out for security, didn't have a business case. It was, and you said it, it's a nice toy, right? I, I still fight that image, but people are seeing more and more of a business case. Um, the video you're watching has gone company-wide, lots of interest from our senior management about what did the project look like? Like this is a, as you can see, it's a big project for a company, but, um, and, and John's point about, you know, take an easy flight first, <laughs> absolutely start small. So just, you know, just some things that I've learned over the years, um, you know, get licensed, get some training, that, that's important. Um, know your area, like John said. Now for me, we kind of fly in very limited areas. We're not out there in public or big public projects. It's mostly, you know, on private property, our own plants. And practice, practice, practice. So again, that leads back to John's comments, right? About take an easy flight. Um, it's a little hair raising the first time you get up there, especially as you get into some of these bigger drones. On this project, I was, I was using my personal little drone and our bigger company one, and, and they do operate differently. So practice, uh, take a course, maintain it. Uh, oh, actually there it is flying right there. That's our... That's our nutrient drill. Um, you maintain it. Uh, you know, these things seem to be, they tend to be pretty indestructible and just fly forever, but uh, they, they do require some maintenance. So, you know, put that into your manual, have a maintenance plan and, and fly it often. What we found is the degradation. If you don't fly it very often, your batteries degrade, you know, software gets out of date. It just takes hours and hours to get things running. But um, it's 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 well you can see the product right again this isn't so much of a risk reduction this is more of a promotional video i guess for the project but but really you know all kidding aside what it does allow you to do is it gets you into that red zone because this is a big lift there is a big no-go zone but with with the drone of course we had to set it up with a crane operator make sure we didn't fly into cables and things but you can see we can get right in there up and close. So it gets you into some of those areas that you can't normally get to, but yeah, do some homework. Um, one thing that we found out uh, <laughs> after we bought our first drone, because we had, we didn't check the rules, of course, check the rules. Uh, we are within uh, five miles of a small local airport. 
which has some impacts as to what we can do within our site um, because we're kind of in the flight path of some of the runways. So it's all those little things we learned. Again, had I had Antoine, I probably would have known it going in, but uh, now we know. So yeah, do some homework, read the regulations, know what you're getting into. And, and definitely that business case, um, a few years down the road, not as important for us anymore because people see the value, but um, you're definitely gonna want those value statements going in, it would be helpful. Thank you, Corey. Good uh, words of advice there. And I would like to expand on this, um, the legality, because we do have a question in the chat about FAA guidelines associated um, training to fly. Um, John, I'm going to hand it over to you if you want to kick us off on that one. Sure. So um, back in 2016, the FAA changed the rules used to you had to be a private pilot in order to fly a drone commercially. And they realized that that wasn't exactly the best way to go about things. So they created what they call their part 107 certification. So if you want to fly a drone commercially, you have to take a knowledge-based test. It is 60 questions. You have two hours to complete it. Um, there's no um, way, there's no prerequisite on how to study for the test. You can sign up for a course, you can do YouTube, you can buy books, software, whatever your unique way of learning is. Um, but then you, it's a proctored exam. You have to go through a, a um, FAA certified exam center and you go and you take that. Once you pass that, now you can fly a drone legally. Like the other presenters have said, doesn't necessarily mean you can do it safely. So get out there and practice but understand your airspace, understand where you're flying, understand the rules. Um, but yeah, your first step is your FAA 107 certification. Then your company, you know, we at AECOM require additional training for all of our pilots to go through in order to fly for AECOM. So make sure you check with your company and they may have policies in place as well. Thank you, John. And if anybody um, wants to add on to that, you're more than welcome. Um, I do see Anton's answering some questions in the chat. That's helpful. Corey, did you want to add to, to that about the legality? Oh, I, I was I was just going to throw out there because because I'm again on the other side of the border here. Um, yeah, very similar in Canada. Uh, our regulate our regulatory body up here is Transport Canada, the aviation branch, and and very similar. Um, and there are many vendors you can choose from the, the vendor that I used actually years ago was, was, I thought pretty good because we did the theory and we actually got to practice. So there's a practical portion. Uh, the funny part is the instructor actually crashed his drone as he was trying to show us how to do it. Right. But it was a good learning. <laughs> so, you know, those are, those are the lessons that you, uh, you can't make up, but. Um, yeah, get, get the training. I mean, it's, it's all available out there. You can find it in our trans, the Transport Canada folks are actually really good to work with. So, Thank you, Corey. And actually, I'm going to call on you for this next question. Okay. Uh, a couple parts to this. How long does an aerial drone last? Is there repair costs? And do you have to replace them every so often? You mentioned doing maintenance on it. I'd love if you could expand on that. Yeah. So we, we've gone through, we're actually on our third um, evolution of, of drones here at, at Nutrient Fort Saskatchewan. And I, you know, I don't know, maybe there's other Nutrient folks out there on, on the call. I know Nutrient Ag Solutions does use them quite a bit on the U.S. side uh, for crop inspections. Um, but, but again, back to our specific situation, I mean, we're plant-based um, um, and we kind of fly, we, we try not to fly in too much, you know, kind of yucky stuff, but we're, we're often around steam outlets and, and vents and stuff. So the very first one we found um, lasted a couple years and we didn't have to do too much routine maintenance. It was, you know, just kind of checks here and there. Um, but what we found was after a while with all of the flight time, the, the, the airframe itself just, it wouldn't kind of hold together anymore, right? It was, it was loose and we just couldn't, we either had to replace a whole bunch of parts or upgrade the frame. So then we went to a new one, got a little bit longer out of it. The disappointing part about that is that the uh, batteries actually weren't available anymore from the manufacturer. So we actually had to park that one and then upgrade to some of the pictures you see now with our thermal imaging. So this one's pretty robust. Again, like I said before, just like with the image quality, um, your service life is probably directly proportional to the price tag. Um, our first venture in was a few hundred dollars, then it moved to a few thousand. And 
something of this uh, ability, you know, you're you're kind of in that ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar range. When you get to the thermal imaging, it's it's often the cameras that cost a lot of money. But so I guess I don't know if that really answered the question. Um, but really, it's just kind of base maintenance, you know. Uh, um, but the, the they're getting more robust and they're really building for commercial purposes now. Thank you, Corey. Appreciate that. Um, I saw a question in here about the software that's required um, when you're working with drones. I, I can't find the question now, but is that something that you have to purchase separately or does anybody want to touch on? Antoine, do you want to touch on the software aspect? Yep, yep. Uh, I think I just uh, answered. Uh, but on the software, so uh, definitely your drone is uh, is a digital tool so some level of software will come with it uh, at least to update update the, the software inside um, you know logging the, the flights uh, and also preparing the flights so that's usually included for free if you want to do um, you know a br full bridge inspection that has you know thousands of images vertical structure Etc. You will most likely need a, a dedicated software. Uh, there's no software that works for every use case. Um, you know, some are better for survey, some are better for uh, you know vertical structures, some are better for uh, agriculture, um, mining, uh, etc. Some of that software are cutting across a couple uh, a couple use cases. Um, often they can be a free trial if you, you know, just reach out to those companies and you can obtain a free trial. My recommendation would be uh, have some data, have some of your own data that you can put in the software when you request that, that trial. So you can really understand, uh, you know, how the GPS location of each image is tagged in the image. Uh, resolution, field of view, um, you know, video compression, uh, thermal, um, etc. Thank you, Antoine. Um, question here, how small of a space can a drone comfortably work in? John, do you want to take that one? Well, it depends on if you want it to come back in one piece or not. Uh, so I have, I have drones everywhere from uh, ones that are, you know, small, like a foot, a foot in diameter to our newest one, which is a drone wrapped inside of a carbon fiber ball that is specifically made to fly indoors and in, in GPS denied environments. So it really depends on the situation. You know, there are drones that have excellent uh, positioning cameras that can fly between things. Um, you know, ones with small propellers, ones that have cages on the propeller. So it, it's it's something that you really have to research and, and figure out where you're going to fly. There is, I think one of the other presenters uh, said this, there is no one drone that will cover everything. So, you know, you're, you're, you may develop a fleet of drones to, to take care of your inspections. Yeah. Absolutely. Can, it, can I just add to that, Emily? Oh, you're on mute. Go for it. <laughs> the most, the most overused term in the last two years. Um, yeah, absolutely. You, you know, John, Antoine, great points, and 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 same here. Uh, being the kind of drone, droney, interested kind of person I am. You know, I've got a little one that really just kind of fits in the palm of my hand. Right now, the one that we fly for Nutrien is uh, 15 kgs, and the wingspan is about you know yay big. So uh, it's 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 quite a it's quite a deal to you know get that thing ready to go and take it out to the field for a day um so if you're not sure there are other options where you can you know get kind of the smaller more affordable ones and see what they can do um you know you don't have to jump right into that thermal imaging you don't have to jump right into all those zoomy functions and everything um they're they're really robust and even the small ones do a great job my little handheld one 4k video and imagery uh, right from the onboard software, whoever asked that other question, you know, they do come with most of the software you need just to make them work. Thank you, Corey. There's a question about um, the benefits of use in law enforcement. Antoine, I saw you just started typing. Do you want to uh, unmute and, and answer that one? 
Yeah, so I've worked with the highway patrols for uh, accident reconstruction. So whenever there's a, a big accident on the highway, it's good to, to really document uh, things and it has to be done quickly. And uh, it's actually dangerous, a dangerous task for uh, law enforcement personnel. Uh, there's, a, there's a city, yeah, it's called Chula Vista in Southern California. They have uh, one of the most sophisticated drone program for law enforcement. What they do is on, on top of the police station uh, on, on the roof deck, they have a, a couple of drones and a couple of pilots. And whenever there's a 911 call where they need to see what's going on, instead of sending a patrol car, um, they send a drone. The drone is faster than any patrol car, uh, which means they can decide, is, is it worthwhile to send a patrol car that might be on the other side of town? as well as get intelligent on what's going on. And you know it can be a fugitive and uh, they actually post some statistics because they, they monitor the success rate. It's a, uh, you know, it, it's a public agency. Uh, so they go for the kind of the full transparency. Uh, they even show videos on YouTube of like uh, actually how they use that with people on the ground and the drone in the air giving intelligence uh, to, the, uh, to the officers. Um, otherwise, uh, it's really a, a search and rescue. That's, that's a, a, another one. That's usually handled by uh, firefighters, uh, sheriff, county. Uh, but it's been, I mean, there's been a lot of people found. I remember the story of a little boy who was just, you know, playing and he went into the, uh, you know, the cornfield. The corn was grown and he got lost. Right, and people are you know, freaking out, and it's it's dangerous. And they sent a drone with a, a thermal uh, a sensor that can locate heat signature, so it's easy to uh, to see the the heat of a of a human or an animal. And in a matter of minutes, they were able to to find him. Um, and has been happening for people with uh, Alzheimer who you know get lost wandering around. Uh, so all of that fall within you know uh, public safety. But I would say accident and um, kind of you know paramilitary uh, uses as well. Thank you, Antoine. Appreciate that. And I'm going to give you the next question here. I'm going to give you one minute to answer it. Okay. So the question is about any safety issues that drones um, bring into the workplace. So how should workers protect themselves? And I learned last week that drones can be very loud, especially in a tight space. So if you could talk a bit about um, protection. Can I defer that question to John O'Corey? You can, whoever wants to take it. John, you're unmuted first, it's yours. One, one of my drones, the indoor inspection drone that I was talking about is uh, 100 decibels. So ear protection is an absolute must when you're flying that. Um, but yeah, you wanna treat, it, when your drone is on, you wanna treat it as a hot, hot scenario. So you don't wanna go up there, put your hands near the props. The, the bigger drones um, can easily take off a finger, it'll slice it right off. So you definitely want to use caution when you're, when you're operating near them. Make sure you have safe landing areas. Make sure you have backup landing areas so that it's away from people. Um, make sure you're inspecting your equipment, not using batteries that are damaged that could cause the drone to fall out of the sky, things of that nature. Just, just one thing I'll add, I know Emily, we're at time here, but um, for plant operations, you know, we treat it as hot work. So uh, if you have hydrocarbons or, you know, whatever kind of flammables um, floating around, we always gas test those landing and takeoff areas to make sure that, you know, we're, nothing bad is going to happen because they, they're not intrinsically safe. At least we've not found one or the ones that we've bought. So we just need those mitigation plans. So and distraction. Do not be distracted. People will come to and, you, chat, yes. and, and, and you're flying, and they said, how high can it fly kind of question, yep. or yep. how quick of, you know, and, yep. uh, you how know. How much does it cost? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where can I get one? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, treat it, treat it as, you know, professional, you know, uh, doing work, and, you know, sometimes there's a vest in the back says, do, you know, do, do not disturb me kind of thing. Uh, kind of like the dog, you know, do not pet me in the airport uh, yes. that you see the, the dog is working or the drone or the pilot is working. Yes, thank you. That was a, a great question to end with, actually. 
Um, and for our um, audience out there, if you haven't seen one of our previous drone webinars, they are recorded. They should be all available up on the website. And then make sure you are registered for next week's webinar. We're going to have Nutrien back to talk about yeah. their submersible drone. Not me. <laughs> it's very exciting to see uh, you guys have some great video footage of that. So make sure you're registered. But I want to give a huge thank you to our audience and to our panelists for joining us today, giving us your time and your expertise. We really appreciate it. And for our audience, you will receive a follow-up evaluation survey. Please let us know how we did, what we can do better. We want to make sure that these um, webinars at, are the best that they can be for you all out there. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to sign off and say have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.